Hi, welcome to all to our special astronomy lecture this evening. Tonight's collaborative effort is between the Southern Vermont Astronomy Group, or SEVERA, the Dublin School's Perkin Observatory, and Middleman Observatory at Middlebury College. For SEVERA, this is also our monthly meeting. For the Perkin Observatory, this is one of our aperiodic astronomy lectures. And for Middleman Observatory, this is our fourth installment of our Middleman Astronomy Lecture Series. We we're very fortunate to continue with this virtual forum tonight in order to extend the accessibility and reach of this talk. In addition to members of SEVERA, students at Dublin, uh, we also have other astronomy and space curious individuals and amateur astronomers from New England and beyond, including other high school and college students from the region. In addition to numerous Middlebury students, we have Middlebury community members, Middlebury faculty and staff, as well as some Middlebury alumni. My name is Jonathan Kemp, and I'm with the Middleman Observatory here under the dark skies in the Champlain Valley of Central Vermont. Um, after a few additional notes, I will then pass it off to Pat Porch of Sovera to introduce tonight's speaker. At the end of the evening, um, Eric Schmidt of Perkin Observatory will handle questions and answers from the audience, so please keep those in mind as we move forward. I would also like to briefly mention some tech notes and rules of the road. This lecture will be recorded, but attendees do not have video enabled and will only potentially have audio enabled for questions at the end. If you have technical questions, please use the chat function to connect with our panelists who are hosting this event. If you have astronomy or other subject matter questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A function. You can also upvote questions or, comment, uh, or comments from others uh, in the Q&A area if you would like to see them addressed after the lecture. You may also ask a question verbally at the end of the lecture using the raise hand capability within the participants window. Chat, Q&A, and participants functionality should all appear on the edge of your webinar window. While we are very happy to welcome students of all ages, minors and other younger students should please seek permission of a parent or guardian before participating in this evening's lecture. Lastly, please remember to share respectfully and with civility as we begin tonight's talk as a community. Now, I would like to introduce Pat Porch of Severa. Pat? Thank you, Jonathan. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on our uh, monthly presentation. Tonight's speaker is Amanda Bosch, who is the Observatory Operations Manager at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Dr. Bosch did her graduate and undergraduate and graduate work at MIT, earning her bachelor's degree in 87 and her PhD in 94. While an undergrad at MIT, she attended the astronomy field camp at Lowell Observatory in 1985. After completing her doctorate, Dr. Bosch was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship at the Lowell Observatory. Between then and last year, Dr. Bosch combined her work at Lowell Observatory with positions at academia, first at Hofstra and Boston Universities, then at two, in 2009 back at MIT. Among her many accomplishments, Dr. Bosch rode aboard, aboard the Kuiper Observatory, Airborne Observatory, and was part of the team that discovered Pluto's atmosphere. Dr. Bosch also co-founded the program, which currently is called the Lowell Observatory Native American Astronomy Outreach Program. This outreach program of the Lowell Observatory takes astronomy to underserved Native American communities. In August of last year, Dr. Bosch returned to Lowell full-time as the operations manager. Dr. Bosch, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, welcome, and at this point, I'm going to turn the virtual stage over to you. Thank you, Patrick and Jonathan um, and everybody. It's I'm glad that um, we can all be here together tonight, um, even though we're in different places. I'm joining you from Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I am going to, let me just see if I can get the, the technology working here. Um, and then I'm just going to jump right into my talk. And I think I need to now um, change my share. No, nope, hold on one second. Sorry. I think I needed to do play first. And then I need to change my share. There we go. Okay. If I'm not sharing the thing, I uh, my, my main slide, if somebody could tell me that, but I think that this is where I'm supposed to be. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about what, what I've been working on most recently, which is a study of small bodies in the outer solar system that are called centaurs. But I'm gonna get into that in a little bit. So I have an, in, um, an introductory slide here, which I guess I didn't need since Pat Patrick gave me such a great introduction, but this is a picture of me out in um, Australia um, at the um, 
uh, four meter telescope there. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get any observations at all when I was there because it was completely cloudy. But um, I've followed a little bit of a non-traditional career path. And so if anybody has questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Um, I started off in academia, as noted, and I'm now in um management and administration. Um, and I started off as an engineer and I moved into science. So there's a lot of different ways to, to sort of get into astronomy. So I'm happy to talk about that with anybody if there are any questions about that. I also want to um, introduce you to Daryl the foster kitten who you may see at some point or you may hear me um, chide him um, for something. He's a little bit in a needy phase right now. So anyway, let me just get started. Um, by talking about, by just giving you this overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about Comet Neowise, which was in our skies about a year ago, not too much time there. Then go into volatiles in the solar system, and then um, solar system formation and evolution, and then how we, how we study all of this through these observational studies. Okay. So for Comet Neowise, um, I'm hoping some people got to see this last year, last summer. Um, it was visible in about June, July of last year. Um, and uh, this is a lovely picture taken um, by an observer in Germany in July of last year of this particular comet. And one of the thing, things that you can see here is that it was, um, you know, we can see some things like that it has two different tails, the two different tails are two different colors. Um, and, you know, just how bright it is. Um, this was a naked eye comet. You wouldn't be able to see, you wouldn't be able to see this naked eye, but you could see that there was something fuzzy in the sky without having to use a telescope or binoculars. And, um, Comets are really interesting that way because sometimes they become really bright so that we can see them in the night sky. Most comets that we have that are orbiting the sun right now, most of them are too faint to see just with your naked eye, um, but you need a, a small telescope or sometimes even a large telescope to see them. And so it's really, uh, it's always an event when we get something that is so bright that you could see it without the aid of a telescope. And one of the things that we just never know is that is whether or not we're going to any particular comet is going to be visible without a telescope, because it depends on a lot of things that are happening within the comet. And I'm going to touch on those shortly. Um, so Comet Neowise here um, was named Neowise because it was discovered by this Neowise satellite up in the upper right there. It stands for the NASA Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. It was discovered um, in uh, March of 2020. And you can see in the lower right, there are these three red dots um, and those that's the comet moving. So basically this is three different pictures stacked on top of each other and the comet is in a different position in each of them. Because it's moving against the background stars, that means it's within the solar system. And because it's fuzzier than the background stars, that means it has a coma and therefore is a comet. On the left here, you see a picture taken by um, a friend of mine, um, Bill Ferris. He took this in Flagstaff, Arizona. And this is this is an image, you know, taken with a camera. So it's 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 brighter than you would see just with your eye, but you could see, um, you know, you could definitely see that there was something there. So one of the things that is nice to think about with comets is, you know, so basically how how bright can we expect a comet to be? And um, we're going to talk about what's going on with this comet later. But so how bright can we expect a comet to be? Well, it really depends on a number of things. First of all, it depends on a lot of geometry. So how far away from the sun is the comet? How far away from the Earth is the comet? Um, and so having those two distances, we um, light the brightness of something um, falls off as one over r squared. So the further away you are, the fainter it will appear to be. And we care about how close it is to the sun because 
um, the sun is what really activates comets. And so we're going to start talking a little bit about volatiles at this point. So I'm going to just pop back to this image. So when we're taking a look at, um, at a comet, when, what we see here, I don't seem to have a pointer, but what we see on that left image is we see this the bright part of the comet and then this long tail flowing back from it. The bright part of the comet is called the nucleus and then it has a coma around it. So what has happened here is um, we have ices that are on the surface of the comet, have warmed up, um, and have then turned from ice into gas, and that's called sublimation. And so basically they're just skipping that liquid phase. They just go straight from solid to gas. And, um, and then the, those gas particles sort of flow away from the comet and give you a larger surface area, which then can reflect sunlight, and so it appears to be much brighter. And so this is one of the things that we're going to be looking at um, that I am looking at and I'll be talking about here is how we are looking at volatiles on the surface of um, ices on the surface of small bodies in the solar system. Basically, we see them when they become activated. What activates them? Well, heat activates them. So ices always have some temperature at which they, they transition from that solid phase to that gaseous phase. This is called the sublimation temperature. And it really just depends on a lot of chemistry that I, just to be honest, I don't understand all of it. I just look up the sublimation temperature in a table, but it does depend on the number of chemical bonds it has and how those bonds are arranged. So with something like um, NeoWise here, which we presume to be mostly water ice, when it gets close enough to the sun that water ice will melt then, um, or sublimate, then these um, then the surface ices will start doing that, will form this coma. And then basically um, radiation pressure from the sun will take those, those um, uh, coma products and push them back away from the comet, forming this really long tail that we can see. And we see these all because they are reflecting sunlight. Um, and so that, those are the things that we are looking at when we think about how bright is a comet. Now, in this plot here, it gives you the brightness of this particular comet versus time. And it, it was um, this one was um, created in July. So that's why the data stop in July there. Um, on the, the y-axis there, it gives you magnitude. And um, for those of you who are familiar with magnitude, you know that smaller numbers means brighter and larger numbers means fainter. That's why as you go up on this graph, the body is brighter and as you go down on this graph the body is fainter and then we just have date on the x-axis here so what we can see here is that the comet was getting brighter and then was expected the the tan line is the model so it was um, getting brighter and then expected to get fainter which actually it did and it does it in a non-linear way um, and that's part of the geometry you know how when does it get closest to the sun when because that's when it's warmest and that's when it will be producing the greatest amount of coma material theoretically um, and um, and so that is one idea of when it might be brightest. Not all comets listen to this and sometimes they do their own thing, but this was a fairly standard comet. And so this is what happened. Um, and we can see this vertical line um, right around July 2nd or so, 3rd, 2nd or 3rd is the date of perihelion when it was actually closest to the sun. So when we're looking at this particular comet, you know, there's a lot of things to think about. Um, how far away from the sun is it usually? Um, is this its first time through the solar system? Um, so uh, we can't answer these questions definitively, but based on um, some of its um, orbital elements, we can kind of get some idea of where it might have been. So what we do is by looking at how the comet moves against the background stars, night to night, we can take those measurements from each night and we can do this not just for comets, we do it for everything, every, all solar system bodies. It's something that in my group we do a lot of. And then what we can do is say, okay, if it's, if it's here on this night and there on that night, that tells me that it must be on this kind of an orbit around the sun. And what we can see is this particular comet was very eccentric. So instead of having a circular orbit, it had a very flattened orbit. And I have an image of that. Um, and um, with a semi-major axis of 306, almost 360 astronomical units, which means that 
So first of all, an astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And so it's the, the semi-major axis or half of the long axis of the ellipse is 360 times that. So most of the time, this comet is bending away from the inner solar system and out in the outer solar system where it's really cold. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but I have a picture just so you can see. So if we look at the orbit of Neowise in the given um, the, the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, this is what the orbit looks like. So it comes through, um, it, um, cl its closest passage to the sun was about at Mercury's distance. And you probably already know that that's pretty hot. You know, that's getting really close to the sun. And then it goes back out. We can't really um, appreciate how eccentric the orbit is in this one. So I've got another couple images here where now we're adding in the giant planets and we can see that, you know, we're still kind of going out. Um, the We haven't reached the furthest point of this particular comet's orbit because we still have to go out even further. And here we have that. So in that centerpiece there where everything is just written on top of each other, that's our entire solar system. And then this, this really long, um, thin oval is this particular comet's orbit. So, you know, why did I pick this one? Just because it was visible recently in a naked eye comet, and there aren't a lot of those. But, you know, there are actually a lot of comets, and a lot of comets have orbits that look like this. A lot of comets have orbits that spend more time in the inner solar system as well. But this one here is actually one that I... Um, that has a lot of similarities to the type of things that I study. And so I'm going to just talk a little bit more about that. So what we're looking at here is a comet, that a body that spends, like I said, most of its time away from the sun. It might even be on its first passage through the solar system, through our solar system. It, there is a um, reservoir of, um, of cometary nuclei that is really far away. Um, from the sun, it's called the Oort cloud. And it might have just been perturbed and come into the inner solar system for the first time. This is a, um, this is a close up photo image of Comet Cheryamov gerasimenko um, Comet 67P. And sometimes we call it that because Cheryamov gerasimenko is kind of hard to, to say. Um, you might know that if you discover a comet, you get it named after you. So um, there were two people whose last names were Cheryamov and Gerasimenko who discovered this particular comet. And we had um, uh, the European Space Agency had um, a spacecraft that orbited this particular comet from 2014 to 2016. So they got a lot of really close up images of the comet nucleus. Now, what are we seeing here? Well, there's a lot of things to take a look at that we can just sort of focus on here. One of the first things that I notice about this is that this body is not a sphere. It's not a regular shape. We call it kind of a duck shape because it has, um, a, I wish my pointer would work, but we have on the top part, we have a duck head and then on the bottom is the body and with an, a thin neck connecting the two pieces. This is called a bilobate shape. And if you remember this, I'm gonna touch on this again later. Um, we actually find that many com of the comets we have really close up images for, more than 50% of them have this shape. So something might be going on here. Um, uh, the next thing that I notice is that there are wispy tendrils coming off of this particular comet's nucleus. And you can see that in the upper left most clearly. And these are um, basically there are areas on the surface that have been heated by the sun that are then sublimating and forming the coma that we talked about that is around this body. And then the other thing that we might look might notice is how smooth parts of the surface are and then how chunky other parts of the surface are. And this is something that um, is a sort of a well-known process on comets. Some of the, the material that is lifted off of the comet during this um, outgassing phase then falls back down onto the comet and then forms a crust on the surface of the comet. comet. But then if um, gases build up pressure beneath that crust, they can kind of punch through it and make a little hole so that they can then escape um, as well.
So this is a, just a spectacular image. All the way across, um, this is um, the larger lobe there on the bottom is only four kilometers across and the smaller one at the top is two and a half kilometers. So these aren't very large, but they can produce, a, they can lift a lot of dust particles off the surface that can make them appear bright in the night sky so that we might be able to see them. Um, when we look at just the overall lifetime um, of a comet during one orbit around the sun, we could start um, in the upper right, excuse me, of this particular slide, where it is the furthest away from the sun that it's going to get. And then what um, we have here is if you go to that um, sort of um, from the upper right, just keep going around counterclockwise. And the um, the little dot there says that the nucleus begins to warm and sublimate as it gets closer to the sun. And then when you get closer to the sun, then you start forming this coma. So that's what we talked about already. And then if you're even closer to the sun, then the solar wind will push out some of these coma and dust particles and form a tail. That tail is always going to be opposite the sun. Um, and um, that, so you can see that the, the orientation of the tail, the direction the tail is pointing, changes as the, com as the comet goes around the sun, past the closest approach to the sun. And then as it goes further away from the sun, it loses its tail, and then it loses its coma, and then it becomes just a bare nucleus when it's farther away from the sun. So the reason that um, we're kind of looking at some of these, I mean, they're spectacular and you want to know what's happening within a comet. And believe me, there are so many, uh, you know, there's, there's, I don't think you can say that there is a standard comet because there's so many different things that might happen, different um, variations in what the tails look like and what they do and how long they are and all kinds of things. There's so many differences amongst comets. You can see, sometimes you see, um, little corkscrew images. If you take a nice deep image of the of a comet, and that's where you know materials coming off of the comet as the, the nucleus is spinning, and so it makes this little corkscrew. Uh, it's just spectacular. All the different options here. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about something that's a little bit simpler because there's no way I can explain all of that, and that's you know somebody else's entire career. In fact, we have somebody at Lowell Observatory, Dave Schleicher, who. This is what he does: is is um, just talk about the morphology composite and of of comet comi and tails. So, what about the composition of the comets, comet uh, coma and the tails? This is something that um, is getting me into some of the research that I'm doing. So, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time. This is a an image of comet Hale Bopp that was taken in 1997. This was a very spectacular comet and definitely visible without a telescope. So again, these things don't come along very often, but when they do, they're really neat. So I, I mentioned before that we have these two, um, these two tails. So the yellower tail here is going to be mostly um, dust um, and some, a little bit of gas as well. Um, molecular gas that is just sort of pulled off of the surface of the comet. And it's pushed off by solar radiation and then it kind of bends a little bit to follow the path um, of, the, the, of the comet's orbit. And then the blue tail here is ionized gas. So you might have um, you know, water coming off of, sublimating off the surface and then um, this solar radiation will hit it and will ionize it. And so what that means is it strips away one of the electrons. And so now you have ionized um, OH, a hydroxyl um, uh, ion floating in the in interstellar space here. And so then that is pushed back also by the solar wind. And it has a it it glows a little bit blue just because of the um, the the uh, the what what the atoms are doing. And so basically, if you look at it with um, a spectrograph, it'll have a nice blue peak. Um, and so this is indicative of what the, com the, co the comet is made out of. So if that comet has water ice, which, uh, you know, we assume that most comets do, then we expect to have some of these products when it gets closer to the sun. And so we can see the results of heating up that water because it forms that coma, it forms this ionized gas tail. And that's, those are all products of water. 
Um, and in fact, you know, there, it's one of the theories about how we, uh, the earth got its water is that, you know, maybe, maybe it was delivered to the earth through comets over time, having, um, you know, all of these comets hit the earth. Maybe that's what brought um, water to the earth. Of course, you know, the, when the earth formed, it had its own water, but then um, there were early phases when the earth was hotter and it was thought to have lost a lot of water. So it um, might have needed to have that water replenished. I'm not so sure that that has been a, a settled question yet, but it looks like um, the, there might not have been enough water delivered by comets. And so there might have to be another mechanism for that. In any case, I'm gonna move forward now and talk about other volatiles in the solar system. So um, first of all, what is a volatile? A volatile is a compound that can be liquid or gaseous at planetary temperatures. And so first of all, you need to figure out what temperatures are you talking about? So things that are volatile at the Earth are not volatile at Pluto. So let's just take water, for instance. Okay, water, we all know about water. It has three phases at Earth temperatures, solid, gas, and liquid in the form of ice, liquid water, and water vapor. It's very important for life here. And so that is definitely a volatile here. But out at Pluto, where the temperatures are much, much, much colder, water is just permanently frozen at Pluto. And in fact, if you saw some of the images from the New Horizons spacecraft that they sent back as they flew by, um, you could see that there were little mountains on Pluto. Those mountains are actually, um, the, the bedrock part of that, those mountains are actually water ice because out at those temperatures, Ice is, water ice is so solid, so, you know, so solid and so dense that it actually forms the bedrock of those mountain ranges on Pluto. So it really depends on what temperatures that we're talking about. So water, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, methane, these are all um, volatiles here in the Earth environment. But if we go further out, they might be, you know, permanently solid. So let's just take a little tour around a little bit. So here on Mars, this is a Martian um, polar cap. I actually, oh, it's the Northern polar cap. And it's uh, um, uh, taken from um, uh, spacecraft images from both the European Mars Express spacecraft and NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So these, um, the white areas here are actually layers of water ice and dry ice, which is carbon dioxide in its solid form. So those are two volatiles in these layers. And then you see, you know, you get some Martian red dirt kind of um, thrown in there as well. So the what what's happening is here is you have some sort of a seasonal cycle. So it'll lay down some of that water ice and carbon dioxide, and then you'll get some sandstorms on Mars, which will, you know, get put a nice red layer on top of it, and then you'll have more deposition of this water ice and carbon monoxide, uh, carbon dioxide, which will be white again. And so you can kind of see how all of these build up. It gives you kind of a history of what's been happening on Mars through the seasons, kind of like taking a tree ring core. So um, it, what this gives us is an idea of, you know, what has been happening in Mars's ice ages. Um, and so we can take a look at these polar caps and see that. Of course, on the Earth, we have the water cycle um, where we have, um, you know, we have precipitation, surface runoff, and then evaporation, condensation, continuing on and on. Um, in a general sense, we can think about this not just for water, we can think about it for other volatiles, but that's the kind of thing that will happen. You will have a liquid phase. Um, which might solidify into a solid phase, in this case ice, or it might not, it might just stay in a liquid phase and then evaporate and go into a gaseous phase. So on the earth, we are obviously aware that water is really important for life. And so we, um, uh, two thirds of the earth is covered by water and you can kind of see this in these NASA images that give you, you know, both sides of the earth and you all the blue is the water. We have a lot of water in the atmosphere as well in those clouds. And there's also surface water in lakes and rivers. There's also subsurface water where water is trapped in rocks 
um, beneath the surface of the earth as well. And so if we take a look at how much water do we actually have on the earth, this is a really interesting um, uh, uh image, I think, to really, that really tells us how much water do we have on the earth. So if we took all of the earth's water and just kind of um, collected it all together and made it, made it into a little marble on the surface of the earth, then we would have that larger marble that we see there in um, the middle of the United States. So that's all of the water on the earth and then also in the subsurface rocks. Um, that marble is about 860 miles in diameter. So, you know, there's a, it looks like we're covered, like there's a lot, a lot of water on the earth, but it's actually not that much. And then um, you can see somewhere around Kentucky there, where there's a smaller marble, a smaller blue marble, and that is, um, represents all the fresh water on the earth. So in the in, so yeah, on surface areas, so in the lakes and rivers, but also within um, underneath the um, ground as well, aquifers, you know, water that we pull up for our drinking water. And then um, there is another um, marble that is kind of hard to see. It's right below the, the middle size marble. It's roughly around Georgia. And this is the um, amount of fresh water that is in that is accessible to us in um, lakes and rivers. And so it's really, really small. So that's what we use for to stay alive for our drinking water. So you can see all of that um, here as well. So how does this compare with other bodies in our solar system if we're thinking about just volatiles within our solar system or just water within our solar system? And so this is a really interesting graphic. What it shows you is that um, the size of the body compared to the size of the marble of the water, if you collected all the water on that body and just made an equivalent um, marble just made of that water. And you can see Earth is quite large and but doesn't, it looks like it has a lot of water, but it doesn't have that much water. And so who in our solar system has the greatest volume of water? It's actually Ganymede, right? Europa Ganymede Callisto. So that's one of the Galilean satellites around Jupiter. Um, and so there's actually a, um, a spacecraft out, you know, out there right now, just looking at that. Europa also has a lot of um, water. Callisto has a lot of water. Titan has a lot of water. Enceladus has a lot of water. So when you get out to the um, area around Jupiter or Saturn, these um, these water reservoirs are mostly are can be the surface anyway can be frozen, but some of them might have um, subsurface oceans that might be heated from uh, various mechanisms. Um, I'm not going to go into them right now, but there's a, there's a lot of water some, you know, besides on the earth, just all the way through the solar system. And there's a lot of other types of volatiles as well, but we're going to, I'm going to focus right now on water. So if we're taking a look at, you know, how did this water get to all of these different places within the solar system? Um, well, part of it uh, is the answer to that is really we have to kind of step back and think about where did it all come from? Um, and uh, and that will tell us how it got to where it is. So basically, our solar system formed from something called a solar nebula. And so this is a cloud of gas and dust that's just floating through the universe. And it is usually the, um, the, the remnants of previous supernovae from other stars that have already gone through their full life cycle and then um, gone into the supernova explosion phase and then just, you know, everything that was inside the star and inside any planets orbiting it are, are now just in this nebula. And then that happens multiple times and these nebulae come together and then eventually they have a little gravitational perturbation and then they start to condense and then they form a new star and a new solar system. And so whatever was in that nebula is what it becomes part of this of the new star and that solar system. So basically, if you're thinking about it, when the first stars were um, coming into existence in our in our universe, um, we really couldn't we couldn't make you know planets like the Earth or have volatiles because those things have to be processed through previous generations of supernovae. So we really needed to wait until, you know, now in order to have all of this material out there from which our solar system could be formed. 
So now we have this this whole nebula that has this comp composition, but then when the, there is a star forming in the center, that's going to be hot. So everything nearby it, if there is, if there are any volatiles there, those volatiles are going to escape because they're going to be, um, you know, turned from you know their solid phase into the gas phase, and then they're going to be pushed out, and so they won't exist there anymore. And the the distance away from the star at which this happens is within this frost line, which you can see in this particular graphic. So basically, that's just how far away can you get, um, and still have. Um, where where water will you know uh, remain solid or become a, a gas. So outside the frost line, water can remain because it stays solid. And then inside that frost line and closer to the star, you probably won't have as much water or any because it's been too warm and whatever water was there or other volatiles have already been removed by the time you form planets. And so, you know, that frost line in our solar system is right around Jupiter. And um, so outside of Jupiter, we expect to have lots of water um, and volatiles that are left over from the formation of the solar system. Inside that, um, we might have some, or if we do have any now, it's probably, it might have been brought there from outside the solar system, um, or planets might have migrated. And so maybe they migrated from a further area and then came in. So there's lots of different possibilities that you have to think through here. So let's talk about some of them. So when we are forming this solar system and going through this evolutionary phase, um, basically, um, uh, you know, we have uh, lots of these clouds of gas and dust that we are forming this solar system from. And this is not a solar system, this is a galaxy. It's M31, the Andromeda galaxy. And you can see that it's, you know, there's lots of light here and each little speckle, each piece of light here is a star and potentially its own solar system. But the other thing that you can see here are these dark lanes um, within this galaxy. And these are the clouds of gas and dust from which you form these solar systems. So what happens when you do form a solar system? This is um, a, an animation by Matthew Bate at the University of Leicester in um, the United Kingdom. And so um, what he's gonna be looking at here is just sort of putting a bunch of material out here and seeing how this material might collapse and form um, some stars. And so let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah, so you see that it forms these little tendrils. And so um, this is the way gravity works. Once there's a, there's a little bit more concentration of mass, it pulls more mass in. And so some of these massive areas are, are sort of building and collecting even more mass to themselves um, and becoming more dense. And so that this yellow area here is the denser area. And so this is where we might be seeing a star or two or 10 start to form. And so you can see here right now that it is a star system was forming there and actually maybe it formed several stellar cores and a couple of them got tossed off. Um, these are still stars, not yet solar systems, but you can see here that there's a lot of material um, and it looks like a pinball game with, with stars being tossed left and right. Um, and then moving down to the lower right here, we have maybe one remaining stars um, left over with some gas and dust around it, which can be used then to form planets around this particular star. Um, and with a lot of material out, still outside, um, still kind of massive, so attracting everything in the region. And so you know, is this what happened in our solar system? We don't exactly know, but something like this is what's happening to form planets around a variety of stars in our universe. Um, so if we take a look at, so this is a theoretical um, uh, demonstration. So this was all done in a computer. Um, it took approximately 100,000 CPU hours. It's just, but you can, you could just, you know, program all the, all the equations. Of, of gravity and whatnot and put some material in there and come up with something like this. So what, what do we actually see out in the universe if we're looking for something that might look like the result of one of these formations scenarios? 
what we see is something that looks like this. This is actual data taken by the ALMA telescope in Chile. And it is the protoplanetary disk that surrounds the young star HL Tauri. And so the, um, the star is in the very center of this. And so it, you can't quite see it because there's still a lot of gas and dust around it. But everything around it, that's that protoplanetary disk that will form a solar system. The dark lanes are actually um, where planets are or should be, because then those planets are actually taking all of that material in those lanes and just collapsing it onto themselves. And so we're expecting this, you know, in give it, give this star, you know, another uh, one to 10 million years. And we should see a system that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ish planets around it. So it might look something like our solar system. All right. I'm just going to move forward a little bit, just being cognizant of time. I'm going to skip that one. Um, we can also think about the, uh, the way the solar system formed is not necessarily the way it is now. There are um, there's some work that a, a couple of different groups have done to show that early in our solar system, this might, on the left here, this is what our solar system might have looked like um, with the planets sort of more condensely packed and sort of just small little debris outside of it. And then there was a scattering phase um, and then um, where a lot of that extra material was ejected and then the planets ended up in their current configuration. So just because things are you know, where we see them today doesn't mean they were always there. All right, so um, again, I'm gonna just kind of go through this a little bit quickly because we've talked about a lot of what I'm talking about here, but um, we've, you know, we've got all of these um, different areas within the solar system that, we, that I am looking at. And what I'm looking at is centaurs. And um, we, those are bodies that orbit in the giant planet region. So this upper right plant panel here, um, they have been, scattered into the giant planet region from the um, outer region, from the Kuiper Belt region. And they spend a really short amount of time in this giant planet region, only about one to 10 million years. And then they're either kicked out of the solar system or they come closer in and they become Jupiter family comets. The thing about these that make them very interesting is that because they spent most of the life of the solar system outside of the giant planet region, they are pristine. So whatever they had when they were formed, whatever volatiles they had when they were formed, they still have them. And so that tells us what our solar nebula was made out of and um, what, you know, what the composition is, what might have been brought in even earlier by earlier generations of things moving in. So by studying the outer solar system, that kind of tells us what the, uh, what the initial phases of our solar system formation might have looked like. So I've got a group of um, students that were working with me at MIT and, um, uh, and then we've also continued some of this work through um, other, other means. So for instance, this is astronomy field camp, which I, I was teaching when I was at MIT and I also attended when I was a student. And so we've been doing a lot of this work to take a look at some of the uh, centaurs in this region. What we do, we do photometry, um, which is producing light curves of um, to see how these um, how the brightness of the bodies changes as they rotate on their axes. So we're taking a look at the largest Kuiper belt objects or trans-Neptunian objects to see if they have light curves. We also um, study their basic shapes by doing stellar occultations waiting for them to pass in front of a star and then move off. And when that happens, then we know exactly how big they are. We're also um, looking for the centaurs. We're doing a couple of separate um, lines of investigation. We're looking for activity on these centaurs. So um, as I was saying, when, they get when comets get close to the sun, they start to sublimate. Um, and for water, we know approximately where that happens, but it doesn't only have to be water that can be the volatile. It could also be carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, or it could be something else. And so we look um, at further distances to see when they might start to have activity, and that tells us what they're made out of. Um, this is um, the Centaur 29P, Schwarzman Walkman 1. It's actually kind of closer to the sun. So this one probably has a lot of water, but you can see this is a time lapse. So that it started in the lower left and goes to the upper right. And you can see the, the, the body itself is getting 
larger because um, more material is coming off of it. We're also searching for ring systems around these centaurs. And I would say about 10 years ago, this was un, um, unheard of and just, I, I would have said there's no way uh, centaurs could have ring systems because you know they're so small. How could they gravitationally keep bind these rings? But um, indeed, in um, we did find that um, that the centaur Chiron has um, a very tenuous ring, and um, in addition, uh, around the same time, um, the centaur Chiricla was found to have. Um, a system of three very narrow rings. So these bodies also have rings. We most we discover these through the stellar occultation technique as well. We're looking at the shapes of these bodies. We can do that through stellar occultations. We're also looking at a couple of different ways. And I mentioned before that some of these comets tend to have comet nuclei that we've seen close up with spacecraft tend to have these duck shapes. Um, on the left here is Arakoth. This is not a centaur, it's a clickerboat object, but it also has this um, duck shape. So two spherical bodies connected by a thin neck. And then on the lower right is um, comet um, cheryamov gerasimenko and then the upper right is comet 103P Hartley 2, which also doesn't have as thin a neck, but also does. So uh, one of my grad students um, was taking a look at these bilobate shapes of comets and seeing if they might also occur in centaurs. And um, there, we, he, he worked through a theory that the shapes formed through um, some a sublimation pressure. I won't go into these because we're short on time, but that's it looks like that's something that can happen. Um, and so then we would expect to see um, most comets having these this um, this two lobe shape and some centaurs, depending upon how long they've been in that centaur region, might have this kind of a shape. So where is all of this work done? Um, well, um, at when I was at MIT, we were using, and I still have collaborators there, so we still do this. We use the Wallace Astrophysical Observatory in Westford, Massachusetts. These are two 24 inch telescopes in those domes. Those are a little on the small side though, so we can only use the, um, those for the brightest objects. And so for fainter objects, we will travel elsewhere. For instance, we'll go to the Magellan six and a half meter telescope in Chile. Um, there are two Magellan telescopes. You can see both of them here. It's a spectacular sight. Um, I really love it there. Um, also, now that I'm back at Lowell Observatory, we use the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope here. Um, it's outside of Flagstaff in Happy Jack and it's a, um, monolithic 4.3 meter mirror that we can use that. It's one of the darkest sites in the United States and um, it's a really spectacular. We get some great data from here. We can also use the Stratospheric Observatory for infrared astronomy. We've done several observations from this. This is basically a 747 that um, you, put, you, you just cut a hole in it and put a telescope in it. It's a um, two and a half meter telescope. You can see in the back end of that particular observatory. And then you can just fly it above the clouds. And if you need to be in a certain location to make a certain observation, you can make sure to be there. So it's been an excellent um, an excellent tool for us as well. And I'm um, just going to say just a, a minute to take a minute to just say a little bit about planetary science at Lowell Observatory, which is where I am right now. Um, obviously, uh, well, I don't know, it might not be obvious, uh, Lowell Observatory is where Pluto was discovered in 1930. It was discovered by Clyde Tomba, who you see here on the left. And um, it was um, discovered using uh, just taking images of large portions of the sky on glass plates with the photographic emulsions. And then taking two of those plates, putting it in a special machine called a blink comparator, and then looking at you know at the so at the star fields, um, the stars shouldn't move, and anything in the solar system would move. And so you can see the circled areas there. This is Pluto moving it to two different locations in the sky from January 23rd to January 29th. And then of course um, that we know what Pluto looks like up close now since the New Horizons spacecraft flew by in 2015. And um, one of our staff members at Lowell, Will Grundy was on the spacecraft team. And so was really involved with all of the planning and data analysis as well. So 
Lowell has a long history in planetary science um, because of Pluto. Um, but um, so that's that's a big deal. So there's a lot of work that's going on. I've mentioned some of the people at Lowell who are doing some of this work and what they're doing as well. In my current job, I mentioned that I'm now in um, administration and management. So what I do as an operations manager is I'm um, responsible for making sure that our observational facilities are are maintained and are operating well. And so I have a, I have a staff who works on this, but I'm responsible for three sites at Lowell. One of them is Mars Hill. On the left, we have the historic 24 inch Clark refractor. Um, we have a 24 inch Dyer telescope in the upper right. And then the lower right is the Godo, which is our observing platform with um, like six, I think it's six telescopes that visitors can look through. Um, we're also observed at Anderson Mesa, which is outside town, which has the Navy prototype, sorry, Navy precision optical interferometer, as well as a 42 inch telescope and a 72 inch telescope and a 31 inch telescope. And then in um, um, Happy Jack, even further away from town, we have the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. The primary mirror is 14 feet across and yet is only four inches thick. Um, and um, it is uh, it is the fifth largest telescope in the continental United States. And with this telescope, the astronomers at Lowell and our partner institutions will study the solar system, exoplanets, stars, galaxies. And also we do, um, not necessarily with this telescope, but we do a lot of cultural astronomy at Lowell as well. So I'm gonna skip this one and just say thank you to everybody. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. You can also feel free to email me at my email address there. So thank you. Okay, as Dr. Bosch just mentioned, uh, we're gonna move into the Q&A now. So thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Dr. Bosch. We'll give you a, just a moment of break here while I talk for a moment. So first, I'm gonna let everybody know that when you leave this webinar, you'll be directed to a survey which asks for feedback, demographic information, and suggestions for future talks. This information is really useful to us in planning future talks and advertising them. So if you could take a moment to fill out as much of it as you'd like, it would be a big help. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Bosch, please type it into the Q&A function, not the chat function on the bottom of your screen. I will then read your question to Dr. Bosch. And for those who may only be listening in, Oh, I'm sorry. And for those who only might be listening rather than watching, uh, you can also upvote other people's questions if you'd like, and I will give priority to those questions. If you'd like to ask a question verbally yourself, please use the raise hand function. And when I call on you, we'll enable you to uh, unmute and speak. I do want to remind everybody that no question is too basic. We have attendees of all ages, education, and experience levels. So please don't hesitate to ask any question you might have. And with that, we'll get started. All right, so comets being small bodies of water and given the distance from the sun when at the outer regions of the solar system, how does gravity capture such a small body and maintain a predictable orbit? What would prevent a comet from just departing our solar system via a slingshot trajectory? This is from Philip Levine. That's a really good question. So comets are, um, yeah, they are, they are, they do tend to be quite small. We think of them as dirty snowballs. So mostly some water and some other, some dirt, you know, so the, um, the density isn't exactly one, it's a little bit higher. It doesn't matter though, they're still gonna not be, have a very high mass. So anything that is, um, so we, when something is um, outside, you know, quite far away from the sun, the pull of gravity of the sun is not very large, but it still exists, right? And so um, we have a lot of bodies that are very far away from the sun, like in the Oort cloud, that are orbiting the sun, but are kind of loosely tied to the sun. And so this Oort cloud can extend for thousands of astronomical units. And we presume that other stars also have or clouds of their own. And so as these, you know, as stars are, you know, we think of stars as not moving, but, you know, in reality, all of the stars are orbiting the center of our galaxy. And so we are going to be slowly passing by other stars. And so we can expect that over long periods of time, some of these Oort clouds may actually start to interact and we may get some overlap. And at that point, you know, a, a comet nucleus that maybe was belonging to another star might actually transfer to us. So some of our comets may, um, uh, may actually have come maybe 
maybe come from a different star, in fact. And so those kinds of things, when we look at, when we see comets coming in that from far away, we can measure, um, as I mentioned, we can measure, we can do the astrometry, we can measure their orbital parameters. Um, a lot of them are on closed orbits, which means they will continue, you know, to orbit the sun. Some of them, as you mentioned, though, are on um, hyperbolic orbits, which means it's an open orbit. So they're just going to come in once and then they're going to leave and then they're not going to come back around again. They're just going to leave the solar system entirely. So it all depends on the orientation of everything, you know, when it got kicked in exactly how much energy it got in one direction, whether or not it will still continue to be bound to the sun or whether it will just come by once and then leave. Hey, I'm gonna go back to a question that's been waiting for a little while. Uh, Bob Fitzgerald asks, does a comet lose significant mass as it passes the sun and will it ultimately sublimate almost entirely on its successive passes around the sun? Absolutely. That's exactly. So it's good, good of you to be thinking ahead there. So it does actually lose a significant amount of mass. I'm sorry, I don't have a number for you right now, but it does lose a significant amount of mass as it goes around the sun. And so you can imagine that if we have a comet that has been, you know, orbiting for quite some time, you know, maybe, as I mentioned, you know, things can get kicked in from the Kuiper belt into the Centaur region, and then they might actually come in even closer and become a Jupiter family comet. So if it's gone around for 10 times, maybe it's lost a lot of that um, volatile mass that it had when it started. And as I mentioned before, the comets are not entirely volatile. They, they do have some solids, you know, some um, rock and dust and something like that. And, and in addition to the volatiles. So over time, we expect that as they keep on going around, then they will lose more and more of the volatiles. Either that or the volatiles will be trapped beneath a crust that will be so thick that we that the heat won't be able to get in and um, sublimate them. Either way, at some point that comet, you know, even though it might have been active very frequently, at some point that comet is going to turn off. And um, there are a number of um, of comet nuclei out there that had been previously seen to be active, but are no longer active. And so they're just called um, dead comets because they've lost all of their volatiles. All right, we have a, a multi-parter here from uh, Claudio Valiz. I'm going to ask them in three to separate parts just to keep things okay. straight. Thank you. Um, the first bit is, what's the estimated range of surface depth of the gravitationally re-engaged sublimated material? In parentheses, the smooth bits. <laughs> the smooth bits. <laughs> so, um, um, I, I actually forgot how the, the beginning of that question. Could you just repeat that again, please? <laughs> Uh, what is the estimated range of surface depth of the gravitationally re-engaged sublimated material? Yes. Okay. So that is a great question. And um, what we would need to do is to send um, a, a lander. We we have had a lander on um, on Cherry Mount Gar Garisimenko, but maybe something that would be able to drill down and see exactly what is the depth of all of this um, dusty stuff on the surface. Um, you can, um, you can use analogs in, um, other, at other places, but I'm, uh, that's, that's pushing it a little bit. So I don't think I'm going to go there and it would take a lot of explanation. So the question then is how, what, you know, how long has it been collecting all of those uh, dusty bits and what pushes them off? And so if, you know, if this comet has been going around and, you know, sublimating and then stuff having stuff refall back on and nothing removes it, then you can imagine that that might be meters thick. But what might be the mechanisms that might remove it? Remove it? And we could actually see some of that on that 67P um, image because it had some areas where there was no smooth air, smooth stuff, where it, and some of them looked a little bit circular. So what might have been happening there is that you might have had the volatiles beneath the surface punching through, and um, uh, in order to get out, you know, pressure building and then punching through. And then when it does that, it's going to definitely disturb all that area. And that's going to, you know, some of the escaping gas is going to pull some of those, um, some of the dusty bits off with it. So um, it's going to be at some point, we need to know the, uh, what activity level and over what time period so that we can figure out what the balance is. So I don't have a number for you. And I think it's going to vary for each comet. 
Okay, part two is, uh, is there a difference in character between the gas which resides in the ionized tail versus the gas residing in the dust tail of a comet? Yeah, so the dust, the, the ionized, it, it's, it is, it could come from the same parent molecule, but then it would just be um, molecular in the dust tail versus ionized in the ion tail. And, or it could also be, just to go one step further, it could also be daughter products. So things can sort of, uh, uh, you can get, um, you know, if you start off with something um, uh, very complicated, some, you know, ethylene molecule or something like that, it could be broken down into daughter products and then broken down even further. And so those you would tend to see in the ion tail as well. And the third part is a little bit of a departure. Uh, love the wall hanging behind you. Is there a story on it? Oh, no, I just, I bought it off of Etsy. It's a Japanese cafe hanging. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Next question is from uh, Kath Allen, which goes back a little bit. Do we assume the frozen water on other planets is safe to drink? <laughs> um, that is a great question. And it would really depend on what else is in on those other planets. So if you have... Um, I mean, we can even just go to, you know, Titan, for instance, that has a lot of carbon compounds on the surface. I would not want to drink the, the water on Titan because there's just a lot of other things there that are not considered to be uh, safe for humans to drink. Um, and so it really just depends on the composition of that particular planet and, you know, what else is there. Hey, Samuel Cartwright asks, uh, can you explain more about ringed centaurs? How has the discovery changed our understanding of these bodies? How has the discovery? Yeah, that's correct. And is it thought that they are common? That is an excellent question. So there are, uh, it depends on how, there's a couple different ways that you can define centaurs. There are um, of order a, a couple hundred, let's say 200 centaurs known at this time. Two of them have rings, um, and the, the the rings that so the Chiron rings are very different from the Chiriquo rings. The Chiron rings are are tenuous and fluffy, and the Chiriquo rings are narrow. Um, and so, um, does that you know two out of two hundred? That's not very many, but it also have, tends to have. So those two bodies that they're on are uh, among the larger um, centaurs. So maybe it is that um, you need to have a certain mass of centaur before you can uh, maintain a ring system. So I'm just gonna start off, I, I can say a little bit more here, but I'm just gonna give this disclaimer that um, this is not what I do. <laughs> um, it's, uh, there's a lot of um, theoretical work here and I know people who do it and they, um, they're very smart and that's not what I do. So, um, but what, what we need to look at is um, what's happening. So what on the surface, right, we have this sublimation. So just because, um, you know, the, the, the um, it's warmed and so now it's something is leaving and taking some dust with it, okay? So it leaves the surface at what, at what velocity? And we can just figure out, we can put a, an, a range of velocities. We can either limit that by observations or we can just make some theoretical approximations as to how fast it's leaving the surface. Well, it turns out that once you do that, um, the, the escape velocity on uh, from centaurs is actually quite low because they don't have very much mass. And so it's really not hard to just leave that centaur entirely and never look back. So if you want to um, maintain a ring system around it, you have to have um, dust particles leaving the system at just the right velocity so that they, you know, they need to have enough velocity so they can get off the surface and into orbit, but not so much that they leave and not so little that they fall back onto the surface. And so um, I think it's a little bit difficult to do that. You can also think there are some studies that say it has to be around um, it, it won't work on a spherical body, it has to be an elliptical body. Um, so that is still absolutely a work in progress because um, I believe it was 2014 when this first ring system was found. And then people have been looking and the other ones have not been definitively found. So, and, and among those people have been me. Um, and so, you know, um, 
it doesn't appear that they exist around all centaurs and the mechanism that gets them there and keeps them there is still um we're still working on that how long they'll last is a question there's just a lot of questions about ring systems around centaurs it's a very exciting field of, of study right now Okay, so Bob, I'm going to get to your question in just a moment, but I'm going to stick with the uh, questions on the topic at the moment, which is uh, Annette asks, do comets ever accumulate material in their orbiting state? So when they are, um, I mean, basically the, um, the, the solar system is just filled with debris, right? I mean, it's one of the things that when you, the astronauts go up, um, they need to, in, in, a space sta in the space station, they need to actually worry about, you know, how often they're going to be hit by some amount of debris. And um, because if you get hit by something large, it can actually punch a hole in your spacecraft, which would be a negative thing because then all of your air would leave. Um, and um, I remember going to see the um, at the Air and Space Museum probably about a decade ago. They had a a display of um, a piece of equipment that had been in space and they brought back down and it was just pockmarked with just, you know, little craters that honestly are made by, you know, very dust size moats pieces. It doesn't take much to make a little crater. So there's just a lot of stuff out there. And um, so as comets will move through the solar system, they're going to be sweeping through that. They're also going to be leaving stuff behind them. So it's kind of, you know, they're sweeping things up and they're leaving things behind them. Of course, when we get to, um, um, when we, uh, the, some of the comet leavings, you know, the tail, the, the material that's in the comet tail, you know, basically over time, it just disperses. It's still there. It just spreads out. So it doesn't, it's not visible anymore. And, but then it's still out there in our solar system. And so sometimes the earth passes through one of those, um, the orbital, the orbital path of a comet, and that's what makes meteor showers. So our meteor showers can be connected to certain comets because that means that the meteor shower happens when the Earth is passing through the orbital path of a, of a comet, which I know is not your question, but um, I just thought I would throw that in there just for fun. Okay. Bob asks something that might be in a few of our minds, which is how do you manage access to the various telescopes at Lowell and how do you go about it reserving time on other telescopes like in Chile? Does the public have access to the larger telescopes or are those reserved for researchers only? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> yes, um, there's a lot of policy that goes into um, thinking into, into that. And so people spend a lot of time thinking about how that's going to work. So uh, different places will do it differently. Um, a lot of times the model that is used is a partner model. And so that is what's used both for the Lowell telescope and for the um, Magellan telescope in Chile. So different, so for instance, low, for the Lowell telescope, different institutions will buy in to the telescope, will buy access to the telescope. So they'll agree, you know, that over X number of years, they're gonna pay this much money. And so their astronomers will get, you know, 30 nights a year or whatever it is. And then once you've um, once you have basically purchased that kind of um, access to a larger telescope, this is this is what happens for you know the telescopes that are sort of four meters and above. Once you've purchased that time, your institution has purchased that time, then the um, the institution has to figure out how to divvy up that time. So you know you may have thirty nights a year, but what happens if you know, all of the astronomers at that institution want 100 nights a year. How are you going to figure that out? Well, you could try to buy more nights, but there may not be more nights available to buy. And so what will happen generally in that case is that you will have um, something called a telescope allocation process. And um, uh, for instance, we just went through that here at Lowell. We do that twice a year and people will, everybody who wants time will write a proposal. They'll say, this is what I would like to study. I need to get these data from the telescope and I need to use this instrument. And this, this is the question I'm going to, to solve. And then a committee will, will review those applications and say, yeah, this one seems technically feasible. This one, they forgot about something. And so it's actually not gonna work. Um, this is an important topic. Um, this one's important, but, you know, is maybe more um, um, serendipitous, you know, so they take all of that into account and then decide who gets that time on that telescope. Um, there are um, um, 
other ways to get, if, if your institution, if you're an astronomer at an institution in the U.S. and your institution is not a part of one of these partnerships, there's something called the Noir Lab. Um, it used to be called NOAO, National Op um, Optical Astronomy Observatories, um, but now it's called Noir Lab. Um, and they have a number of larger telescopes in the U.S. and in um, Chile, and then astronomers, U.S. astronomers can apply to that time that they've basically purchased for all astronomers in the U.S. And same kind of a thing, go through that process to try to get some of that time on these larger telescopes. There are also a number of telescopes in the um, US and elsewhere that you can purchase time on. Um, I know, I think Telescope Live is one of them and iTelescope um, where you can just, um, anybody, you know, professional astronomers or amateur astronomers or people who are just interested can just sign up for a certain amount of time and take, take whatever data you want to take during that time that you've signed up for. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can get access, but it does. It is true that access to the larger telescopes is a, is a little bit more difficult to get. Okay, and a, a related question: Why are uh, from Nathan? Why are so many space objects named after Greek and Roman myth? Yes. <laughs> so the um, the naming of things is controlled by the International Astronomical Union. And um, they have decided that certain types of bodies will be named after Greek gods or Roman gods, or, you know, so you have to, you're, the names of these things have to fit into this overall theme. So um, things that don't are um, uh, things like um, comets are named after the discoverers and asteroids, um, can be um, named almost anything that the discoverer chooses to name it, but with some with some restrictions. Okay, and our last pending question. So again, we can still take more questions if uh, Dr. Bosch, if you're up for that, so don't hesitate. But uh, what we have up here is from Michael Henley. What causes a comet's antitail? Is that more of a um, perspective? Perspective observation? Perspective observation? I remember a visible comet with such a tail sometime in the late 50s. Yeah, the anti-tail is really quite quite uh, spectacular. It is um, um, it's it is a perspective issue. So you have the two tails. Um, they are not ex you know, they're not exactly in the same direction. And so um, depending upon where the sun is, where the comet is, and where you is, you can actually see one that appears to be going in the opposite direction as the other tail. It's, it's quite spectacular when it happens, but it's entirely perspective. Okay, I don't see any more open questions or hands up. These were great questions, so thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right, we'll give it another second. But uh, Dr. Bosch, you have any parting thoughts for us? I just wanted to thank everybody for your time, for coming in and, and asking such great questions. And um, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to talk with you, even if it's not in person. <laughs> okay, well, nothing else has come in. So we will call it a night there. I want to thank everybody for joining us and especially Dr. Bosch for giving us this excellent talk. Uh, again, there is going to be a survey that pops up uh, once you leave the meeting. Uh, it would be a great help to us if you took a moment to fill that out. So please do so. Oh, we have one more question from Jeff, which is where will the video be available? Um, Jonathan, can I tag you for the answer to that question? Absolutely. Uh, within about a week or so after we um, edit it and polish it up, we will put it on what's normally the YouTube channel for Middleman Observatory at Middlebury, but it reflects uh, these lectures that we do uh, across our New England organizations. Um, I will go ahead and try to quickly put a uh, link into the chat in just a moment before we sign off for the evening. So give me just a second. and. Um, here we go. So it should appear at the link that I have put in the chat, uh, but it could be several days before it finally appears though. So 
thanks for that question. But uh, we definitely want the uh, the content that Dr. Bosch and and, um, and whatnot that has been shared tonight, as well as kind of the fantastic questions, uh, to be shared and to live on and, and to educate many. So we do appreciate that question. Okay. Well, I think that's a wrap. Thank you all for joining us. And we're going to go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you very, very much. And again, thank you, Dr. Bosch. Appreciate it very much.